Hey Icon, good to be with you today. We are continuing in our series, He's the One, uh, as we kind of trudge through the Gospel of John. And I, I have a confession to make today uh, that will surprise some of you, perhaps comfort others. Uh, I am a Calvinist. I know. Some of you uh, are, are strangely comforted by that confession. Others are a little worried and skeptical, and many of you are probably wildly confused. Uh, so here, here's, here's what that means. Being a Calvinist is simply kind of the theological conviction that God is in charge of everything, that God is responsible for every good thing, and in fact, and, and perhaps especially responsible for my faith. Now, uh, I, I actually did not grow up with that conviction at all. The churches that I kind of was raised in and taught in didn't believe that. And it actually wasn't until I was a college pastor in San Diego teaching the passage that I'm teaching today that I came to this conclusion, right? So here's what I want to do today. Um, I, I want to teach this passage. We're in John chapter 6, starting in verse 35. I want to teach this passage, and then we're going to kind of zoom out and look at three big principles uh, from the passage and then uh, come to a conclusion. Now, for, for those of you who are a little worried about the fact that I've confessed to be a Calvinist because you've heard things, or you know things, or you, you know for sure you are not one, I, here's, here's my ask today that you would just track with me through the passage. Because we're just going to look at the words of Jesus. We're not going to look at the words of Calvin. We're only going to briefly look at the words of Paul even. We are centered on the words of Jesus. And so my encouragement to you is to just take Jesus at his word and, and, and try to wrap your head around, and more importantly, your heart around, the heart of God for you that Jesus tells us about in this passage. So, with that, let's get in John chapter 6, starting in verse 35. Now, this is where we ended last week, but I, I want to start because this passage, this whole section of John 6, is kind of what I, I want to call a grace sandwich, right? So we've got a first section that's kind of 20 to 35, and then 36 to 44 is the meat. That's the grace. And then after that is the other piece of bread in the sandwich. So we did the first piece of bread. I don't know why. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, and all of a sudden I'm thinking sandwiches, right? So this is a kind of a grace sandwich uh, passage. And so it ends with, that, that first piece of bread ends with verse 35. So let's start back there. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, this is the call of God for you to believe. Jesus repeats sections, things like this over and over and over, right? Anyone who believes in me, if you will just come to me, you will never thirst. If you believe in me, you will never hunger again. This is the common call. This is the call that Jesus makes to all human beings to say, come and believe in me, be with me, and you will receive eternal life. Now, the rest of this section that we're going to look at is a little bit of a strange aside, right? It doesn't really flow with what Jesus is talking about. So I don't know what was going on in the hearts of the Pharisees or in the hearts of his followers at this point, but Jesus thought that this was the moment for him to pause and kind of go, hey, just so you know, like all of you, I'm inviting all of you to come and be with me and to believe in me, but, but it's but it's not easy. And in fact, it might not even be possible for all of you to do so. And so he kind of does this little aside here to explain what he means by that, right? So verse 36, he says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So here, here's what he's saying. Jesus makes this great offer, right? I'm the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never thirst again. Anyone who believes in me will never hunger again, right? Like that's an amazing offer. Who wouldn't take him up on that offer? And, and especially because of what he has just done. In the last two pages, he has healed a paralytic. He has fed 5,000 people and he's walked on water. And now he's simply going, hey, believe in me. I've shown you some proofs. Just believe in me and you will have eternal life right? And this verse 36 is actually an echo of verse 26, where 
When the people had chased him to the other side of the sea, he said to them in verse 26, you, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Again, he's going, listen, you're following me, but you're not really following me for me. You, you want food. So you've seen what I've done. Instead of seeing that what I've done says something about who I am, you just want more of what I've done. So again, back in verse 36, Jesus goes, I said to you, you've seen me, but you don't actually believe in me, right? You, you don't actually want what I'm offering. And, and I want to pause here to kind of set up a theme that's going to be kind of true throughout the rest of this passage that Jesus is saying, I'm offering you this amazing eternal life in, in, you know, for, for all eternity and this flourishing life in, in, in between now and eternity. And all you have to do is believe. Remember, we talked about like that, that door. It's just this little door that you got to walk, to walk through that is belief. And yet, he says, many of you will not do it. In fact, many of you who are watching this or listening to this now have not taken that very simple step of belief. Why? Why can you look the offer of salvation, the offer of eternity, the offer of satisfaction, how can you look at that knowing that the only ask is simple belief and turn it down. Um, C.S. Lewis, who you may or may not know, is a personal favorite of mine, wrote a, a, a book called The Weight of Glory. And it's actually a kind of a, a collection of lectures that he gave. And the first is called The Weight of Glory. And it's my favorite thing Lewis ever wrote. And in it, he uses this very famous uh, illustration. And if it's not famous worldwide, it's at least famous because I use it so much, right? He says this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, right? So I, I've used that quote probably one million times in my life, but it is so perfect in the way that it articulates the, the choice that we have before us and our predisposition to make the wrong choice. Lewis here says, God offers us a holiday at the sea, which is British for a vacation at the sea, right? Holiday, vacation, it, I know. But he says, we, would, we are content to make mud pies in a slump, to fool about with things like drink and ambition and sex, which are the equivalent of mud pies in the slum, while God offers us eternal satisfaction and eternal life with him. He goes, God doesn't find our ambition or our desires too strong, but too weak. We don't, we don't desire the greater thing. We do desire the lesser thing. This is a bit of what Jesus is getting at in this passage. We'll see how it unfolds as we go. Verse 37 it says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Now, this is where it, Jesus begins to kind of unpack the, the how. He's kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit to go, here's how this thing comes about. Here's how, or here's why many who have seen me do miracles and taught this glorious offer of salvation still will not come to me for me and will only come to me for bread. Here's why. He goes, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Now, this is, this is God's solution to our heart problem, right? He goes, listen, the only way that people will come to me is if the Father gives them to me, right? That the, the, the Father has to intervene in some sense in order for us to actually come to Jesus in belief. We will otherwise choose mud pies always, unless God intervenes. So God opens our stubborn eyes to see the glory of the holiday at the sea and see it in light of the mud pies we've been playing with. And we'll see how in a moment. Verse 38. 
It says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, right? So one of the big themes of this passage has been Jesus's unity with the Father, that they are of one mind and on one mission. So Jesus goes, listen, this was not really my idea. I have been sent here to do the will of God, and this has been God's will since the beginning. In fact, uh, Paul picks up this theme in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Paul says, Blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Right? So Paul goes, before the foundations of the world, this was God's plan. Jesus says in verse 38, I have not come down from heaven to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me, that this has been God's plan from the beginning. Verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me. Now Jesus can get really specific. This is the father's will, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Right? And so every time Jesus talks about the last day, or I will raise them up on the last day, this is what theologians call eschatological, meaning it's about the end times, the end of things. So here's, here's Jesus' logic. Anyone who comes to me, and believes in me, will have eternal life, will be eternally satisfied from everything they thirst for and hunger for. And all those that the Father gives me will come to me, and all those who come to me I will keep and raise up on the last day. This is, this is what will happen. This is secure. This is sure. This is Jesus' claim to us, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes will have eternal life and be kept in Christ until the last day. Now, verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. Now, a couple things here. One, basically the Jews, and this, anytime it's capital J Jews in, this, in the Gospels, it's the Pharisees, it's the religious leaders. They're going, wait a second, you, you came from heaven? No, man, we know your parents, and they're not special, right? Like, you, you're talking about how you're the, you're the son of God, you're the son of the Father, and you're, you're doing what the Father wants you to do because you do what the Father's doing. He goes, I, we know your father, it's Joseph, Right? Fine, good guy, carpenter, moderate carpenter, but good guy. But certainly, you, you didn't come from heaven. Now, here's the problem. And I, I, I always like to picture these things. I don't know if the Jews are saying this out loud to Jesus, or they're turning around and grumble, grumble to each other or something. But here's the thing. Never grumble around Jesus because he reads minds, right? So he knows what you're thinking. If you're grumbling, even in your own heart, you're just thinking it. Jesus calls you out. He does that all the time. It's a bad idea to grumble in front of Jesus. Here's what Jesus says. Verse 44. No one, verse 43, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. This is, the, this is the money verse. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And again, he says, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, this is kind of the negative version of what Jesus has already said. He said, God the Father draws people to, to the Son, and the Son will raise them up. Now he's saying the, 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 the reverse, the negative version. No one can can come to me unless the Father has sent me, draws him. Now, this word can, it's important to understand what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying no one is allowed to come to me, right? 
So we sometimes say, you can't do that, and that means you're breaking the rules. It's not the word Jesus is using here. The Greek word is duname, which is power, to have the power. He's, he is literally saying, you don't have the power to come to me unless the Father draws you to me. And all those whom the Father draws to me, gives the power to come to me, will be raised up at the last day, right? So some people will try to argue that what, what Jesus is talking about is a, a, a empowering what some theologians call prevenient grace, that this empowering happens to all people, that yes, left to our own devices, we could never come to Jesus, but that's none of us are left to our own devices, that God's prevenient grace goes before, prevenient just means kind of goes before and draws all people to Christ. But that's, but that's not what he's saying, right? Because we would, if, if that was true, then uh, Jesus would be raising up all people at the last day. And we know that that's not the case because he ties belief and coming to him with drawing and being raised up the last day. And we know that not all people come to Jesus. We know that not all people believe Jesus. So Jesus goes, no one can come to me. You don't have the power to come to me unless the Father draws him. And all those whom the Father gives to the Son, draws to the Son, will come to him, he has already said. And he will raise them up on the last day. Verse 45. Here's how that happens. It is written in the prophets. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 54. And they will all be taught by God. Here's Jesus' commentary. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Now, let me pause. He's quoting Isaiah 45 and goes, there are some who will be taught by the Father. Jesus' commentary on that or his explanation of that there is verse four, at the end of 45 where it says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So let me say it this way, that there is a, a certain way in which God reveals himself to mankind, to women and men, that he teaches them in a unique way that opens their minds, that empowers them, opens their hearts in such a way that they can come to Jesus and, and truly come to Jesus for Jesus and not simply come to him for bread, right? Jesus goes, this is how it happens, that God the Father actually teaches them in a unique way. Now, he, he kind of has this aside for what I think is probably like the hyper literalist in the crowd who's like, well, wait a second. Are you saying that God the Father has to be my rabbi? In order? And he goes, no, stop. Just don't. Don't do that. He said, I I'm the only one who's seen the Father. No one else has seen the Father. But those who have been taught by the Father who have learned from God in, in some Holy Spirit kind of empowered way will actually come to me for me. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. So we've got two pieces of bread on this grace sandwich. Now, this is, uh, for many, a, a difficult passage to get your head around. And, and for many, a difficult idea, a difficult concept to get your head around. And so here's what I want to do. I want to summarize this passage in, in three points and then kind of draw a couple of conclusions. So summary number one, uh, no one, no one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws them to Jesus. He says this clearly in verse 44, no one comes to me unless the father who sent me draws them. He's going to say it again in verse 65, he says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the father. Okay. So no one comes to Jesus unless the father draws them, right? You are not capable of making the decision that Jesus asks of you. You can't make the choice to the holiday at the sea. You will always, left to your own devices, choose mud pies in the slum. Why? Why is that true? 
it, it's, it's, just, it's just simple belief, right? Like Jesus is offering eternal life and a, a, a flourishing, thriving, fully satisfied life between now and eternity. And all we have to do is believe. Why can't we do that? Why does Jesus say, you don't have the duname, the power, the capability to make this decision? You just simply don't. Imagine, a little illustration for you. Imagine that for 500 days in a row, somebody puts two plates of food in front of you and tells you to make a choice. One of them is filled with a, a juicy filet mignon. Oh medium, medium rare, a little bit of blood in it. Mm, delicious. Some mashed potatoes, some, some broiled Brussels sprouts, personal favorite of mine, and a thick piece of buttered French bread. I don't mean to trigger the gluten-free among you, but man, that sounds good. You, you got a, a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon on your right and a, and a rye whiskey on the left. Is that too specific? This is basically like my death row meal. I, I've I've thought about it just in case. Wait a second. This is Seattle. What am I talking about? There are just raw vegetables everywhere. This is one plate. Just you're surrounded by raw vegetables. This, I feel like that's more Seattle. The second plate. The second plate is filled with raw pig brain covered by the excrement of an unidentified owner. Your sides for the evening are lightly braised rat tail and something yellow running off the side of the plate. On your right is a goblet of pig's blood and on your left, a hollowed out animal skull filled with kombucha, which is the grossest thing I could think of, right? This is your choice. And every day for 500 days, you make that choice of what you are going to eat for dinner. The steak and mashed potatoes and Brussels sprouts and bread and wine and whiskey, or the pig's brain and excrement and rat tail and pig's blood and kombucha. This is the choice for 500 days. Now, would you obviously on day one choose the steak? 100%. Even the vegan among you would eat the mashed potatoes and the Brussels sprouts. On day two, what would you choose? Obviously, plate one, the steak. And day three, and day 100, on day 200. Now, would you ever get tired of plate number one? Yes. Yes, you would get tired of it. Yes, you would be discontented with the steak and the mashed potatoes. No matter how well they are preserved, the same thing day in, day out would get old. It might even make you nauseous to think about that same meal again and again and again and again and again. But would you keep choosing it? Yes. A hundred times, 500 times, you would choose the steak. You would never choose the pig brain covered in excrement with the pig's blood and the yellow runny stuff. You just would never do it. You would never choose. On day 499, you might get curious and be tempted to take a nibble of some part of that, but you wouldn't. You would choose, again, the steak. You would be unable. You would not have the power to bring yourself to choose the plate number two. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why is the gospel uh, pig brain? Well, isn't the gospel good news? Like, why wouldn't the gospel be the steak and the, and the world be the pig brain? Now, think about this. Because to your rebel heart, allegiance to Jesus means loss of control. It means a loss of autonomy. It means that you can no longer be number one and without intervention, our hearts will never willingly choose to be number two. And so to us, the gospel, even though it promises eternal life, even though it promises a flooring life in the here and now, will, will never look like anything but pig's brains to our hearts without the intervention of God. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul says this in another way. It says, no one is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. And again, in Ephesians chapter 2, 
verses one through three, Paul describes it this way. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived with the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul goes, we begin at dead. We begin at at following the passions of our body and the passions of our mind. And the, the doorway of simple belief in Jesus is the doorway that causes us to have to put away those desires, to no longer follow the passions of the body and the mind and to follow Jesus. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he is the creator, that he is the sustainer, that he is our salvation, and that his path is the path of life which means the elimination of all those other things. And our hearts, without intervention, will never make that choice. Number two, everyone the Father draws will come to Jesus. That the the powerful movement of God, the Father teaching our hearts, learning from him, will never not result in people coming to Jesus. When God opens the eyes of a woman, when God opens the eyes of a man, each and every time they will come to Jesus. He says that in verse 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. He says it again in verses 45 and 46. It is written in the prophets and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Everyone the Father draws will come to Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Why are you a Christian? When, when so many are not. Now, and, and I'm assuming that many of you who are listening to this or watching this are Christians. So just for those of you who are not Christians, I want you to kind of listen along. But if you're a Christian, why? Why did you choose to follow Christ when so many others did not? And you may say, well, because I believed. And I say, great, but, but why did you believe? You say, well, because I repented of my sins. And I say, great, I'm so glad, you, glad that you did, but why did you repent of your sins when so many people haven't? You may say, well, because I wanted to be forgiven from my sins. Yes, but why did you want to be forgiven? What was it about you What was it in you that separates you from all of the millions of people who do not believe? Are you a little smarter? Are you a little humbler? A little more wise or understanding? A little more open to new ideas? What is it? You see, if I believe that I receive the grace of God because I believe right? If if, if my position is I receive the saving grace of God because I believe, then whatever it is I think that was in me that caused the grace of God to come into my life had better never leave because if it does, so too would the grace of God. Right? So if, it, if, if, if I think to myself, well, I was just a little more humble. I'm, I'm just a little more humble than all of those millions of people who can't humble themselves in the sight of God. I could, and so I came to God because of that humility. Well, then your salvation is dependent upon your continued humility. If you just think to yourself, well, I was just a little more open-minded or I was just a little smarter, I was just a little more wise, I could just understand a little better. Well, then those are all conditions of your salvation. But if I believe simply because I'm chosen, then that means the love of Christ has come into my life unconditionally which means that there is nothing about me that makes me better than anyone else or more prone to belief or more likely to follow Christ. And this isn't the only place that the Bible says this very thing. In Romans chapter 10, verse 20, 
Um, Paul is quoting the Old Testament saying, God saying, I have, found, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Notice the order that God doesn't say those who seek me will find me. He doesn't say I showed myself to those who asked for me. The order is important. Similarly, in John 15, 16, Jesus again says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide, right? That the appointing comes before the fruit. The fruit doesn't warrant the appointing. Acts 16, 14, Paul describing, or Luke describing Lydia's conversion says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Not that Lydia liked what Paul said and so opened her heart to God. That the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And then in Acts chapter 13, verse 48 says, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Not those who believed were appointed to eternal life. Luke says, those who were appointed to eternal life believed. A, a lot of people say and believe that they were saved by grace. But what they really mean is, I was saved by grace because... I was saved by grace because I was smart enough, humble enough, open-minded enough, obedient enough, whatever enough. I'm saved by grace because I did something. But Jesus here says that you were only humble enough, obedient enough, or open enough because you were saved by grace because you were drawn by the Father. That the first actor, the first movement in salvation is the movement of God to draw us to the Son. That the first movement of God is to teach people in a unique, God-like way that opens our eyes, opens our minds, opens our hearts to be able to see Jesus, and that draws us to Jesus. Which means you can take zero credit for it. There is no place for boasting. There is no place for arrogance. There is no place for ranking to say, well, I was more open, or I was more humble, or I was more intelligent. And there's no place for it, which is Paul's point in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Not the result of works. It's a gift. It was given to you so that no one can brag, no one can boast, no one can rank themselves higher than anyone else. The whole thing is a gift given to you by God. But more importantly, it means that you can never lose it. And this is Jesus's point to us multiple times. It's number three for us. Jesus will keep you to the end. Four times in these short few verses, Jesus makes the point that he will keep us to the end. Verse 37b, all the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Verse 40, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father has sent me, draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus didn't save you because of something about you. So there is nothing about you that can make Jesus give up on you. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, this may seem like a random place to go, but it's one of the most beautiful moments in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, God says to his people, says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, 
It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For in fact, you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. God says to Israel, I saved you out of slavery. Why? Because you're big? No, you're actually small. Because you're rich? No, you're actually poor. Because you're powerful? No, you're actually very weak. I saved you because I love you. And I love you because I love you. It's got nothing to do with you. God loves you because God loves you. And that's it. Not because they were big and powerful. He simply loved them because he loved them. And he loves you because he loves you. Now, is this circular in its logic? Absolutely. In fact, love, true, unconditional love, has to be circular or else it is not true, unconditional love. Tim Keller talks about uh, his mentor, a guy by the name of Ed Clowney, who's been super influential in my life as well. And he talks about how he, ta he taught on the circular nature of true love. Clowney argued that real love has to be circular or else it's manipulation or it's conditional, right? I imagine that you're married or you're dating and you've dropped the L-bomb, right? I imagine this. Imagine uh, you go to your husband and you say to him, uh, why do you love me? Right, which is a, which is a trap, first of all, right? Just a flat out trap. Husband should jump out the window at that point. There's no, there's, there's one right answer to this, right? The only right answer to why do you love me is I love you because I love you. Because think about this. If the answer is, well, you're so beautiful or, 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 in, or, or it's because of, of your ambition or your career, Maybe a wife says to her husband, you, you provide uh, safety and security for our family. You're, you're such a good uh, father to our children. I love you because. Anything that comes on the back end of because is death. Why? Because if you tell your husband, I love you because of your, your career and the security it brings our family and the way you work hard, what happens if that job goes away? So does the love. If a husband tells his wife, well, you are beautiful, the most beautiful woman in the world, that's why I love you. What, what is meant probably as a great compliment is actually an, an incredibly foolish thing to say and a crushing weight to put on anyone. Because what happens when he or she ages? What if they get injured? What, what, if, what if for whatever reason their looks fade because all of our looks fade? Then that is a crushing weight of insecurity to say, well, if my love from you is built on, it's based on any other thing, then it's death. It's death. But if, if you go to your spouse and say, why do you love me? And, and they simply say, I, I just, I love you because I love you. Sure, I, I, I may have met you and I was attracted to you or I was drawn to your ambition or I was impressed by your career. That was the, the occasion of my love for you, but all of that has gone by the wayside and I simply love you because I love you then if you say that to your spouse, they will melt into your hands and do anything you ask of them, okay? Just a piece of advice. That's the only answer. That's the only answer that is not manipulation. Because inherent in saying, I love you because you're beautiful is saying, keep staying beautiful. And that's manipulation. It's conditional love. It's a contract. You stay beautiful and I'll stay loving. You stay in that position. You keep making that money and, and I, I will return it with love. It's a contract. 
If you have a God who says to you, I love you because you repented. I love you because you submitted to me. I love you because you are keeping the 10 commandments really well. Don't you see that that's not love either? It's a contract. It's manipulation. It's a condition. And don't you see how fragile that is? Jesus is saying the opposite of that to you now. God loves you, and it's got everything to do with God and nothing to do with you. So what do we do with this? Well, there's a couple of things. One, if you are uh, not a Christian listening to this, I will say this. The spiritual journey that you may say that you are on, that you may describe, I'll just tell you, that journey is not being driven by you. To the degree that you are feeling drawn by God to Christianity, drawn by God to Jesus, and there's something kind of increasingly beautiful and attractive to you about Jesus, just know that that is God drawing you to him. Go with it. Walk with God. Follow that drawing. Run towards that drawing that you feel in you. That is God moving in your heart. Any desire you have to pursue Christ is the love of God being poured into you. You aren't making it happen. You are feeling the love of God. Walk in it. Pursue it. Ask questions. Find out more. Read more. Talk more. Learn more. If you are a Christian, This doctrine that is often called election or predestination should do two things in you. One, as you come to embrace it, it should humble you. If your faith is a gift given to you by God, and that gift was given by sheer grace. In other words, you are loved simply because you are loved and there is nothing in you that can separate you from anyone else. You aren't smarter, humbler, more obedient. You are loved. This is, this is a, a weird thing where there are so many people that I meet who are Calvinists that become arrogant and it makes zero sense. It undermines the whole conviction that everything good in you, it's not as if God gave you enough grace to make you saved and the rest of it was on you. No, every moment of growth, every moment of perfection, every moment of obedience, every moment of humility is a gift given to you by God. So you may, in fact, look at the people around you and go, yes, I am more holy than them. I follow God more faithfully than they do. Then say, thank you, Jesus, for doing that in me. Because none of that was you. It was all grace upon grace upon grace given to you by God. So it ought to humble us. Second, the more you embrace this idea, the more confident you ought to be in the future. Your future is simply not up to you. Your place in God is absolutely secure. It has never been about you, not from the beginning, and it won't be until the very end. Jesus will not lose you. Humble and secure. That's the point of this passage. That Jesus is looking at this group of people who are arrogant, needy, and he goes, in me, you can be humble and you can be secure. Let's pray. Jesus, for many of us who have lived our whole lives in Western culture, modern Western culture that tells us that we are autonomous, that we are the center of the universe, that the individual is what matters most, that free will and choice is what matters most. All of this runs contrary to that and challenges us in deep, deep ways. But Lord, I I believe that when we continue to think about it and really search our hearts, we know it to be true that most of our lives have been marked by coming up short, by rebellion, by wanting to do our own thing, by not wanting to be controlled. That if we really asked ourselves, like, why do I believe? Not the reasons, but the, the unction, the desire, the power. What, what made me want to? 
that we would get to a place that we cannot answer. They would go, I don't, I don't know what it was in me. I heard the same words as the person sitting next to me. I was moved and they were not, and I can't explain why. And only explanation that we could come up with is about our own ability to be humble or smart or wise or understanding. But I think we know that you are the one to receive credit for our faith. That it was given to us as a gift. That we didn't earn grace, but we didn't even earn our own faith. You gave it to us. So God, I pray that we would be humbled by that. We would understand that that means we are secure in you because it was a gift given by you and you don't take back your gifts. You will raise us up at the last day so that we would be humble and secure and come back to you going, give us more. We, we want more grace. Please give us more grace. That instead of reaching for discipline to enable us to grow, we would ask for more grace. And Lord, I pray for those who are watching or listening and they are not Christians, but they have begun to feel or they've been feeling this drawing in their hearts towards you, that they see your beauty in kind of ever increasing amounts, Lord, that they would walk in that, they would respond to that, they would pursue it, they would move with the flow, the draw of your loving grace and that you would save them, that you would open their eyes fully to who you are and what you've done for them. We ask things in Christ's name, amen. Now, as always, we'll transition to a time of response. We'll do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, the band's gonna come back and lead us in worship. And, and, and I would say a, a message like this, the, the best response that we can give to it is simply worship. Because we, we, at Icon, we worship by singing songs to God that are about God, not primarily about us, but about God and who he is and his greatness and his grace and his glory and his goodness in our lives. And so to respond to a moment like this where we hear God loves you because he loves you is, is simply to respond through singing his praises. And we're going to give because we have a generous God who gives to us, and so we too will give. We're gonna take communion because we're gonna remember that the moment in history that made all of this possible was Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. And so we'll take the bread and remember his broken body, and we will drink the cup of juice or wine to remember his shed blood. But then we will sing, sing his praises, sing his glory. So. Let's take a moment, as we always do, for a time of silence to reflect on what we've heard, and then let it sing together. <laughs>